Excellent. Thank you very much. My name is Jay Judge. I'm the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Development and External Affairs here at Seton Hall. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2019 Seton Hall Athletics Hall of Fame. We're going to have a wonderful evening honoring six amazing pirates. Following dinner, we're going to hear from Larry Keating, Joe LaSala, Owen Monahan, Richie Scheid, Khadija Simmons, and Laura Taylor. I would like to thank our two inductee sponsors of the evening, Ernst & Young and Gourmet Dining Services and the Frangillo family. I'd also like to thank everyone who purchased ads that you will see in the program that were on your seats as well as you'll see during the slideshow throughout the evening. We also have a small silent auction that you may have seen in the uh, cocktail re reception room. We'll be bringing that inside. Please take a look if you have a moment. We have a, good f we have a few good items there as well. As you may know, our Vice President and Director of Athletics, Patrick Lyons, will be taking a new role here at Seton Hall beginning July 1st as Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff to the Office of the President. Though this will not be his last event speaking, this will be as Director of Athletics, we know this will not be the last time we hear from Pat. He will not be far, we will continue, he will continue to help the athletics be successful and build off the unbelievable foundation he has set. Ladies and gentlemen, our Director of Athletics, Pat Lyons. Let me just echo what Jay said and welcome everybody. Um, this is a tremendous night. We get to hear some great stories about the great history we have here in the athletic department. Um, I want to first and foremost uh, just welcome the inductees to being in our Hall of Fame tonight. It's a tremendous accomplishment. You all are so deserving of it. And uh, a round of applause for all our inductees. So with that, as you all absolutely know, we lost, a, um, we lost a Hall of Famer this year who was truly, um, if there was a Mount Rushmore Hall of Fame people at Seton Hall, um, Coach Shep would be, would be the first one on there. And so I just want it, to, it's really appropriate in my opinion to take a moment right now to, to, to take a couple of seconds to just have a moment of silence for Coach Shep. Thank you. And I do also want to uh, specifically recognize Wait, you're gonna want applause to this person. Um, Coach Shep's wife, Phyllis, is here, who looks fantastic. Uh, where are you, Phyllis? So a round of applause for Phyllis. Thank you for being here tonight. So I do wanna take a, I'm not gonna go through the list, because there's, thankfully there's so many that are here tonight, but I, I would ask, if you're in our Hall of Fame, could you please stand for a round of applause? And finally, just as I started before, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's here tonight for supporting this event, to supporting our inductees. As you can see from being on campus, as you, as you can see from being in this beautiful room, this is a brand new facility. It's an incredible facility. It's just one of the many things on campus that are new. If you've been to our athletic department recently, and I hope you've all had a chance to get there, especially I know we have a lot of former athletes here. I know there's a lot of former softball players, baseball players, soccer players. And I was specifically told to watch the softball uh, team because they were pre-gaming somewhere I heard too so uh, by multiple people told me that but anyway if you can see all the facilities that we've built especially specifically for athletics and you can see right now we're doing a um, uh, an eight million dollar project on ONT Carroll Field for our soccer and baseball programs we've had tremendous growth here in the athletic department and that's due to everybody that's here and so I thank you for that um, really enjoy tonight enjoy all the history that we're going to hear about inductees congratulations again and go Pirates Now for our invocation, Father Nick Figarelli.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Father Nick Figarelli. I'm the Associate Director of Campus Ministry here at Seton Hall University. Uh, Father John Dennehy, who many of you know is the chaplain of the basketball team, sends his regards. He was supposed to be here, but there is a convocation, a meeting of the priests of the archdiocese, and so I managed to get out of it, so he said to me, then why don't you say the prayer? The other thing I have to confess is um, last time I was at a, hall, a sports hall of fame induction, then it was my last year when I taught at Seton Hall Prep School, but uh, Seton Hall University, Seton Hall Prep, there probably are a lot of prep graduates here. I had, how many prep graduates? I had nine wonderful, nine wonderful years there, so it's like somewhat being at home. So let us bow our heads and ask for God's blessing. Let us pray. God of all goodness, through the breaking of bread together, you strengthen the bonds that unite us in love. Bless us and these your gifts. Grant that as we sit down together at table this evening, in joy and sincerity, we may grow always closer in the bonds of love. And we ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you and enjoy your dinner. Please enjoy your first course and dinner will be out shortly. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've all been waiting for, the six introduction videos and the six speeches from our six honorees. We'll be going in alphabetical order, so we will first show the induction video, and then the inductee will come up for their speech. First up, Athletic Director Larry Keating. he was there, the people that he hired, uh, the improvement in the facilities, the improvement in the budgets, the money he raised, uh, and the camaraderie that he fostered in the department, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that meant more to Seton Hall than Larry Keating. First meeting Larry, he doesn't come across as the most personable, uh, outgoing uh, gentleman maybe that you've ever ever dealt with in your life. But but after you get to know him, you certainly come to understand that that you know he's he's a really genuine good guy. And I think Larry was uh, assertive. I think he was strong, and I think he was a visionary. He, he's an incredible friend, uh, but fiercely loyal. You could count on him. You could go to war with Larry over something, you could disagree, you could fuss, but when it got to big issues, if I had to be in an alley fight, I'd like to have Larry Keating standing right next to me. Uh, he was emotional, but emotional in a good sense. He really cared about the individuals, the young men and the young women. He cared an awful lot about their academics and uh, what he did with Robin Cunningham to make the academic support system so much better. And that was probably even more important to him than anything that happened on the fields or on the courts at Seton Hall. So at that time, we were over in Stafford Hall, which was not the Stafford Hall that it is today. It was, we shared it with some squirrels and pigeons, quite honestly. And I remember tutoring student athletes in there and having to, you know, kind of get out of their way. So when uh, Larry told me that in, in the plans to redo this building that he had made space specifically for um, academic support for student athletes, our own private offices, and a tutoring space, I mean, we were just over the moon about that. Well, I think uh, during Larry's tenure, Seton Hall had an incredible run, which was culminated by its trip to the Final Four in the National Championship game in 89, in which we lost on a pretty controversial officiating call. 
You know, Larry was there the whole step of the way. He was part of the fabric of the basketball program. But what people forget about Larry is the, 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 the so-called other sports there had success. Probably the great story about Larry took over as AD and they were a week away from the start of the soccer season. They didn't have a coach. And Larry went out and hired Ed Kelly. And from there, Ed uh, led Seton Hall on an incredible run and, 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 and numerous uh, uh, bids to the NCAA tournament. I was Larry's first hire. He gave me a phenomenal opportunity that changed my life forever. He was a great man to work for, very supportive and down to earth with a vision for the athletic department. Well, the basketball program, it would be hard to overstate how much Larry meant to our program. I mean, every little detail, uh, whether it was, you know, where we stayed, how we traveled, uh, he worked so hard to increase the budget for the assistant coaches for uh, recruiting. He understood scheduling. He, he, he was a master at scheduling, and that was really important because to get into the NCAAs, what you had to do outside of the Big East schedule was really important. And Larry would know from year to year how good our team could be and uh, what kind of schedule we needed in November and December. And he'd get us into big prestigious tournaments, but uh, he always put us in situations where we had a chance to succeed. Uh, I certainly think that Larry Keating is uh, way more knowledgeable about how it really works, how, how uh, college basketball is ran, uh, how college athletics uh, uh, works. I think he's as knowledgeable as just about anybody out there because he's had every, you know, he's had every level of job. You know, he's been a coach, he's, he's been an administrator, he's certainly worked in conference offices. He's, he's done just about everything and, and, and I believe he has a wealth of knowledge and certainly he passed along a lot of that knowledge and wisdom to me. I think it speaks for itself. You just look at his 13-year uh, tenure as the athletic director, the success they had. Obvious what happened in men's basketball program, but uh, Seton Hall athletic program was a lot better uh, when Larry left uh, from the time when he accepted the position. When he arrived, the dorms were less than full, the facilities were less than impressive, but that all changed. The men's basketball team going to the final of the NCAA had a rippling effect in shaping Seton Hall as the vibrant university that we know today. Uh, Larry Keating deserves to be in the Hall of Fame because he probably did as much for any individual to make Seton Hall a great place to go to school and to compete uh, in athletics, whatever your sport was. He cared deeply about the individuals there. Well, the next fall when we came back, I'm in there working. You know, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do over there with student athletes or something, and in walks Larry. I'm like, well, he didn't ever come over there. And uh, he handed me the little box jewelry box and I opened it and it was my final four ring and it, you know he didn't have to walk it over I could have come over here and gotten it I remember it like it was yesterday and it, I think that's the kind of leader he was you know that was a big you know, highlight for all of us it remains such a highlight for all of us even though it's so long ago but all of us I think not just me, get emotional about it still. But I remember him coming in and handing me this little box and I opened it and I, I was as excited about the ring as I was him taking the time to walk it over. And it meant the world to me and I remember it vividly. It's an honor and privilege for me to present to you for induction into the Seton Hall University Athletic Hall of Fame, Larry Keating. Alphabetical, that's the way it went. <laughs> so I spent the last few days trying to write some stuff down. I had too many pages. So I cut it down and then I cut it down again and then I couldn't read it. By the way, Robin Cunningham, who didn't show up tonight, I know she had a reason. I got through like tonight. Everything was fine. And then she starts with that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> 
right? <laughs> so, so anyway, I brought my napkin up just in case. Uh, but I, I promised I would. Uh, so what, what I did is I looked over the, the report that I had, or the, I should say the speech I had, and I kept in the hotel room a couple of times, I kept breaking up myself. And I realized that it was not about the events and the stuff I was talking about. It was about about 50 people that I was attempting to work into the story. And each of them had, like Robin's story, you know. So I decided that, I, uh, that I'm not going to make it through the night if I do this, 50 people. So I made it a point, and I, I think I probably met 30 of them tonight. Made sure to thank them for coming. It's probably... 10 or 15 that didn't come for whatever reason. There's probably four or five that I haven't seen yet uh, that I will make it a point to see that if they're here tonight. Uh, but I, first of all, I need to thank Jay and, and Pat and Jimmy and, and whoever else was responsible for this. I honestly never thought it would happen uh, for a lot of reasons. But So back in 2014, when I was included in a group that honored the 25th anniversary of the Final Four team, that to me was my whole thing, induction. Whether the school meant it that way or not, it didn't matter, I took it that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just wanna, just wanna thank those people that were responsible for, for getting me to this point. <clears throat> the other thing, I, I need to congratulate the, the fellow inductee. By the way, Rich, I, I hate to be an AD about this, but when, I don't know who it was, Pat said, could I have all the, Hall of Fame induct, uh, you know, Hall of Fame induct, stand up. You're not in the Hall of Fame yet. You're not, until you get the thing, you don't have it, so <laughs> just relax. It'll come, but just relax. So, but, but Rich and Owen were here as athletes uh, during the time I was here. Uh, Joe was, I, I called Joe, Joe was the rookie in the group. Frank Walsh, Bill Ayers, Bob Brennan, there's a whole bunch, and Joe was there. And, and was great for me, but you gotta admit, Joe, you, you were the rookie with some of those guys. Now he's the king. He's, he's going to the Hall of Fame himself. Uh, Laura, I, I actually have been a big softball fan since my days at, at, uh, Seton, at uh, Delphi. <clears throat> we did pretty well there, and so I followed it, uh, and we tried to build softball up. It was not too good when we got here, but uh, so I knew about Laura, because I had seen the articles, so I, I knew about her. Uh, I did not know about Khadija Simmons. But all I knew was, it says next to her name, 2015. It's not even four years later, and she's already going into the Hall of Fame. Some of us have waited 30 years for this. <laughs> so, so congratulations to Khadija. Where is Khadija? Coach told me, I, I, I sought out Coach tonight. I said, Coach, tell me, I mean, pretty good. She goes, yeah, she was, she's the best we ever had. I said, oh, okay. I said, I, I hope so, because three and a half years she's getting in, like, <laughs> there's gotta be some reason for that. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, the other thing I did, I, when, when Jimmy called me, literally the next day, I researched a little bit online uh, the Hall of Fame. There are 245 people in the Hall of Fame. It'll be 251 after tonight. Uh, if we all make it. Uh, <laughs> of that number, and I probably missed some, over 30% of those people in the Hall of Fame, and, I, and how, many, how old is the, is the athletic program now? How many years? A hundred and something? It's got to be at least that. Over 30% of the people that are in the, the Hall of Fame did their thing, athletes, coaches, supporters, trainers, everybody, during the time I was here. So if anybody wants to know why or how I got here, it's because that's the example right there. Those 30%, which is about 75 people that were, were here and did their thing for Seton Hall Athletics during that period. Uh, so it's, it's a, that pretty much explains my presence here. Uh, there are also, I, I, I talked to Jimmy right after, I said there, there's 10 people that are still on the staff today that were, well, two of them were athletes, Rob Shepard, who I haven't seen yet tonight, and Jose, that are now coaching. And then the other eight uh, 
are still here. Kathy, Matta, Petey. I, 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 I think I described Petey to Jim, and she said, who the hell's Petey? I said, well, Petey is the third baseman of the Adelphi softball team. That's how I knew her. So anyway, but she's here. She was gone and came back. Uh, Kevin McGlynn was a tennis coach for a while left, and he's back. I guess he's only back 18 months or so now. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Robin, obviously. Carolyn Gackle, who, who is a trainer for us. I understand works in the med, med school or the, whatever the pre-med program is. And Coach Moon. Coach Moon disappointed me tonight, but I found out why he's not here. He thought it was tomorrow. <laughs> but I, I have stayed in touch with John. Matter of fact, we brought his track team out to the Kansas Freeways a couple of times, and uh, John, John was a great. Uh, he was a great person. He, he is he's an all-timer. He sh he's, I don't know if he's in yet, but he's been an Olympic coach. He's coached every national team. He, he's a great, great coach and deserving not only of this Hall of Fame, but the track Hall of Fame and everything else. Great athlete himself. Uh, then there's Debbie Spraga. Where's Debbie? Debbie Spraga, and I, this is the only story I'm going to tell about an individual, I think, tonight. When I first came here, we didn't have a band, a pep band. So I talked, I guess I talked to Richie for a while, and Richie came up and said, oh, you know what? I'll ask the people at East, East Side High School, and uh, maybe they'll come up. So we had the East Side High School band came up the first year. To say it was a disaster is an understatement. <laughs> but hey, it was the best we had. So I was determined that we were going to have to improve this. And I went over to the music department, and I forget who was the head at the time. I said, hey, you got anybody that have any interest in, in uh, volunteering or you know, maybe getting paid a little bit but to run the pep band? And Debbie stepped up. And today, she's still one of the band. Uh, story, the only story I'll tell on somebody. Final four, 1989. Been to a lot of tournaments, a lot more since I left. But, uh, the, the meetings, the meetings, uh, the pregame meeting, the pre-tournament meetings are always all the things that are going to go on. One of the things they talk about is who's going to play the national anthem. Well, he didn't do that back in 89. So literally like a half an hour, I don't know, 45 minutes before the game, the national championship game, Debbie comes up and he says, well, who's playing the national anthem tonight? It was a good point. But it's always the highest seeded team. We're both number three seeds. So I go to, Jer I think it was Jernstein. I went to Jernstein. I said, Tom, who's playing the national anthem tonight? He goes, I don't know, Michigan, I think. Why? He goes, well, you know, it's Michigan. You know? <laughs> I said, no. I said, we're both three seeds. He goes, you're right. We'll flip a coin. So at half court, literally at the, by the table at half court, Jernstad and somebody, I don't know who the other one was, if we flip a coin to see who's going to play, and I win the flip. And I look over at them and I go, eh, we got it. And they went crazy. <laughs> so, Three, three uh, I had so many highlights that I, when I started listing them, I just, there's too many. But the, the, the three things I would talk about. When ADs interview today and get a job, you'll always see written, like the AD came in and he gave us his 100-day plan. What are they going to do in 100 days to, to change this program around? Uh, and they all have that. Well, we didn't have that, but I did have 100. I didn't know if I had a plan, but I did have the first 100 days. And during that first 100 days, a couple of things. One is I went to coach and I said, tell me what you need. Tell me the things, write down on the list, what do you need to get better, to, be, to have us get better. And he wrote the list, he, he followed that, he wrote the list out. He was like 35 things, <laughs> all right? And I looked at the list, and typical when you get that, I looked at the list, and I would say easily 10 of them or 15 of them we did in a week. It was just making a decision, a couple of bucks, whatever it was. And then it took, I, I think it probably took us at least a year, if not longer, to get, I don't know what the last one was, but it took us a little longer. So that was part of my 100 day, but it was the early part. The second thing was, when I came here, I think there were maybe six or seven full-time employees in the athletic department. P 
PJ and two of his assistants. Phil, I'm assuming, Phyllis, were you full-time at that time? So Phyllis was full-time assistant to Sue, and I convinced Sue to give up basketball and just be the, we didn't call them SWAs then, we'd just be my assistant, uh, associate. Uh, and it was, it was, uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Well, anyway, I, I guess jo uh, John Woody. Right, John Woody was the SID at the time. That might have been it, because John Moon was working in whatever they call it, H-E-O-P, was doing something in coaching track. Shep was teaching and coaching baseball. Everybody else was part-time. And in the book, or, or the presentation, that Monsignor and Dr. Dees gave to the Big East, all right, the, the, Big East, the Seton Hall's opportunity in the Big East was on the line because it hadn't been stepping up properly. And so that was part of the whole emphasis about making the change. And in that book were all the things that the Monsignor promised we'd get done and hiring staff, full-time coaches, a whole bunch of stuff. And I think, I'm gonna say in 100 days, that's how I look at it. In 100 days, I hired 25 people, at least, maybe more. No interviews. One interview, no advertisement, no clearance with personnel, nothing. Eddie Kelly, he's the first guy I hired. Two days after, he wouldn't have a soccer coach. We had a game in a week, we didn't have a soccer coach. We didn't have a team, forget about a soccer coach. <laughs> All right, he was the first one I hired. Chris Mornash, I think, might have been the second. I hired him in the stands at the Meadowlands at the, at the kickoff football game that Saturday night. Rich Enter, uh, Chuck Dees put me on to him. Uh, Rich Ensu was the first ticket manager and marketing promotion. More importantly, he took care of Richie, because that was important. It was important to everybody that Richie Regan get taken care of, and, and we did that. Uh, so it was, a, it was an interesting time. Every Monday, after about the second week, Monday would come, I'd walk into the office, Betty Murphy, who was my Back in those days, they called them secretaries. Can't do that anymore. It was administrative assistant. Uh, and she'd say, well, Mr. Allison needs to see you. OK, so I go over to see Jim Allison. He was the financial aid, the, the financial director, the CFO, I guess you call him. He said, Larry, you just hired Eddie Kelly. You paid him his salary. Who told you you could do this? He said, well, I had to do it. I said, no, no, nobody told me. I said, I have a book that says we've got to do certain things, and that's what we're going to do. He said, well, you can't do that anymore. You know, I, I said, Jim, go talk to my senior. I got a book that says what I'm supposed to do. You go talk to my senior. <laughs> Literally, probably four weeks in a row, Monday morning, Mr. Allison wants to see you again. <laughs> I think it went like seven weeks. And I remember the last, the last one happened. I don't know who it was. And he, he said, well, I'm telling you, you can't do this. Like, you, we don't have a budget for this. They said, well, that's your problem, not mine. I said, you know, we, we hired these people. And so I walked out. So they go in Monday, and you know, Mr. Alice wants to see you again. A typical Monday morning, yell and scream at me. So I, I walk out, and I said, you know what, Betty? I'm 7-0 and oh so far. And I ain't about to go 7-1. So don't worry about this. And whatever it was. And that was the last one, because I think I went a little too far in explaining to Jim that I wasn't going to be dealing with this anymore. Like, go see the Monsignor first. Don't come with me. Go see the Monsignor first. And the Monsignor, to his credit, was very supportive of the whole thing. By the way, Robin talks about the ring. 1989, yeah, when, I don't know when Robin got there. When did she say she got the ring? In September? Probably got the rings in by then. That's by the way I wore it tonight. And uh, I also walked over to Jim Allison's office and gave him a ring. Friends for life. <laughs> Friends for life. I'm telling you, from that day on, he was my buddy. He never bothered me. I never bothered him. <laughs> I didn't worry about it. Rings can do a lot of things for people. You know? uh, <laughs> how, how did I get here? Well. It's an interesting story. Three times in my career, I have been literally a week away from going to work on Wall Street. My father worked on Wall Street for 75 years, so the day he died, 
and that was where I was supposed to go. And I, I didn't want to do that. I started coaching and coached for 10 years and then just stayed in it. But there were times when job changes came for whatever reason. And it got to August, and I didn't have another coaching job or anything. And it was, it was little things happening all of a sudden. And PJ, I actually interviewed for a job out in the West Coast in June. And it was actually his father who recommended me to a Jesuit priest at an institution out in California. And it got down to two of us. And uh, this would have been in 1985. And I had to go from there. I went to the NACTA convention, which happened to be in Vegas that year. PJ called me in Vegas. He said, well, don't take the job. He said, PJ, I didn't get the job. He said, I don't know yet, but why? He said, well, things might happen here. And maybe you can come to see him all. I said, PJ, I do not want to go to see him all. I said, I, I know what you've been through, and I, I, very, I said, but I, I'm not sure I want to do that. And it lit well, I didn't get the job. He probably called me again. He said, oh, you didn't get the job, so no. He probably had his father call the priest out there and say, <laughs> throw him out. But anyway, uh, so I, I didn't get the job, and I still didn't want to apply. I mean, I, I tell a story about how that year we, were, we had a women's swimming event, Delphi versus Seton Hall. And I dealt with Sue on the contract, and, they, and I sent the contract down, the contract come back. And I see the signature, and I pulled Sue. I said, Sue, who's this guy signing, signing this? Mel's gone at that point. Who's signing these contracts? She said, oh, it's the president of the university. The president of the university is signing a women's swimming contract? Ooh, we got problems. So that, that's an, another reason why I was nervous about going there. But things went on through the summer. Literally, they had five or six people interview on a Thursday, and, and PJ called me the next day and said, you gotta apply for this, I'm telling you, said, you, you can get this job. So I finally gave in, I sent my resume, and Chuck calls me Monday, and I came in for an interview, go through the interview process, which was interesting in itself, and end up getting the job. So, blame PJ for this whole thing. <laughs> He's the one. Uh, so the first 100 days was a, was a highlight. I think the Commissioner's Cup in 93, was always big to me. Probably didn't mean as much to a lot of other people, but when you go from where we were at in 85, I mean, the teams, the, we had three or four teams were not only the worst in the league, they might have been the worst in the country. Volleyball, soccer, there's probably a couple others. Shep, he, he was the bellwether, John Moon, they, they, those guys were doing their job and was getting done, but everybody else was struggling. Uh, so it was, a, it was an interesting time the Commissioner's Cup in 93, I, I, don't know, I don't know the sequence. We won a golf championship at some point. We won a volleyball championship. In 93, basketball won both, champ, both the conference tournament and the, and the regular season. Uh, and, and we obviously accrued enough points to get the Commissioner's Cup. That meant more to me as an administrator than almost anything else because it showed that we just didn't get good in basketball or one or two sports, but the whole program was good. Uh, I think the other highlight that I have to point to was the 22-day the journey in 1989. We started out in Tucson, we went to Denver, we went to Seattle. Stayed in our own hotels, which was a big trip. <laughs> Joe was trying to find hotels, and we, you know, we stayed at a different, because I, I adopted Frank Rienzo's policy, the team doesn't stay with the fans. They stay alone, don't be bothered, so we, we pretty much followed that. And uh, we, we were successful. I had a contact. My sister actually had a contact with Lowe's Montana Canyon. And then we ended up staying in the Lowe's Hotel in Denver. Seattle was sold out. We couldn't get anything. So I, I go in a day early uh, just to try to find something. I called Joe. He said, I got something. Go to this. I don't know what the name of the hotel was. But go to this. What was it? Oh, it was a double tree. I kept, I, that's right. Double tree at the airport. So I go, you know, I go in, and she gives me the, he gives me the lady's name, I go in and see her. And I said, uh, who I was, and she says, oh, oh, I'm all set. Let me show you what we're gonna do. She takes me to the side of the building. The bus will come up here. You get on the elevator, you go up to the second floor, that's where we'll give you the keys. You won't have to bother with anybody. She goes through this whole thing. I said, did Joe give you all this already? And she said, no, this is, uh, this is the Georgetown plan. I said, what do you mean? Well, Mary Fenley, who maybe you don't know, was John's assistant for years. Mary Finley went to that hotel in February, in January of that year 
to do arrangements for the final four. All right? That's how friggin' good Georgetown was and how arrogant they were about it. This was it. So we inherited Georgetown's scene, is the way it was. And including the, the chairman of the board who had a yacht that he brought up from San Francisco to have a party with the president. And we just plugged Monsignor and the boys into that. And that guy, I think his name was Barry, was a friend of ours for life. He's a big time Georgetown guy, but we were his number two. So we, we got a few things done. Uh, and then coming back, you know, 22 days were on the road, by the way. We didn't come home for 22 days. And, and it was, the f I think it was the first time anybody ever did that, because I had a lot of arguments with the staff at the NCAA about why would you want us to fly all the way back and back out again when we can just go in, give us a couple of days per diem to cover our cup. And she finally got it done. Betsy Stevenson was her name. She was Tom Jernstadt's assistant. She said, okay, Tom agrees to it, we do that. But I don't know if anybody's done it before. I know it already done it before. I don't think anybody's done it since. But it was a great, great year. And we celebrated that a bunch of ways. But uh, and then came back here to, to South Orange and, and all the things that we missed being on a row came out, like the, the scene in town and bunnies and all that stuff that was going on that we never knew really much about. Uh, so that, I would say that that probably is the biggest highlight. Everybody would expect me to say that, but there were other things along the way. So in the end, I, I would say my own career, which by the way, I, I announced my retirement about a month and a half, but I don't know how long ago it was. But I was retired in July, and like three days later, Jimmy calls me with this. So like the whole thing has been a haste because I, I'm, I'm going through a little bit of it, even in Kansas with all the people that have been there for 16 years. We've done a pretty good job in basketball. <laughs> We've won 14 conference championships. Uh, coach, by the way, whoever did the video, great clipping, I'm tell you something. Because I was about, I saw the clip that Bill Self sent and he took his little shot at the end and I, and I appreciate the fact that you took that out of it. But. <laughs> I'll get him, I'll get him sooner or later, but, uh, but it, I would say three things. All these young kids would come to me over here. It started when I was at Adelphi, you know, the prophetic, go talk to Larry King, he'll tell you how to be an AD, because he's an AD. So, I, I mean, half the time, I couldn't, I don't know what you tell a kid who's 19 years old, he's in the pro academic program, and he wants to be an AD. I said, like, well, when you graduate, you don't become an AD at 22, because you want to be, you gotta pay the price along the way. So I, but I, I try to find a word as to, why, me, as to why I went from place to place, why I did the things they did. Uh, the word is serendipity, serendipity. I think the definition of that is something good and happy that happens that you have no control over. And that's what happened to me. Each step of the way, there was something that happened. My relationship with PJ, which began on a golf course when he was a GA golf coach and I was coaching golf at Hofstra, neither of us could play a lick and I knew how to drive the van and go to the delicatessens for dinner, but that was it. <laughs> and PJ and I used to go, you know, we'd, when we played matches and I'd see him and we'd, that night we'd, I'd give the keys to one of the older guys on the team and say, okay, here's your meal money, we'll see you later. We went out recruiting. All right, so we, we did, that's how we developed the relationship and then he got the job at Wagner and we played a little bit and he used to come out and call me and we'd, He'd come out to, to recruit, even when he was at Seton Hall, you know, who the guys in Long Island, because I, I knew all the Long Island guys. So it was a, but serendipity is a big, it's a big thing. Look up the word and Google it, as they say today, and you'll see the definition, and that's exactly what I was. Secondly, I would say, hire good people and trust them, all right? I've never fired a person that I hired. There's been some people that were, you know, eased out, it might have taken a couple of years to let them understand that this is maybe not be the profession they wanted, but never flat out fired anybody. Because I always felt, I brought you here and I paid you, I'm trying to give you everything you can. You know, people don't realize when you get fired, when you, when you change jobs, it's traumatic. You don't think, you know, oh, I fired a baseball coach yesterday, you know, big deal. Well, that guy's got a family and it, so I, I never wanted to ever fire anybody, so I didn't. And I said the last thing would be the loyalty. Be loyal to your athletes, be loyal to your coaches, be loyal to the staff, be loyal to the institution. 
And I think, you know, I've met so many people tonight, I, I should have said I had about 50 people on the list to, to, to acknowledge and I couldn't do it. But fortunately, I've met a lot of them already, so I, I've thanked them. Uh, but I would say that if the one thing I did was I was always loyal to the, to the staff and to the athletes and, and to the institution. And I, I appreciate that. I thank you guys again for bringing me here. Uh, it means a lot to me. I know I'm the first to pick up them alphabetically, but that's okay. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Have a great evening. <laughs> Larry, thank you very much. Congratulations. Next up, Joseph LaSala. When you think of Seton Hall University, you can't not think of Joe LaSala. Um, Joe bleeds pirate blue, um, just about as deep as anybody I've ever seen. So the most important place to start in talking about Joe LaSala is that he's the best friend you can have in the world. He is undyingly loyal, um, he's the greatest listener, and he's wise. And so when you take those qualities, um, that means he's an outstanding lawyer and he's an outstanding counselor. And I think Seton Hall University Athletics and Seton Hall Law School have benefited greatly from all of those traits. Joe's um, uh, one of the most selfless, devoted, loyal, uh, kind, hardworking, loving individuals that I've ever met in my life. Uh, and you can see that in, in the way he devotes himself to his life, uh, his work, his family, this school. A man of great integrity, uh, impeccable character. Uh, he's a very loving individual, devoted to his family. Um, I look up to him as a mentor, friend, uh, father figure. Joe is actually very funny. Um, if you don't know him well, you might, you might look at him and think he's only serious. Uh, but Joe is somebody who can have a lot of fun. Um, and I've known him since I was a kid, so I have a pretty long, long history and perspective on that front. Joe learned at an early age what it was to have to work hard from his mom, who worked hard and supported three young children. children. Joe absolutely gets it from his mom. His mom loves this university. His mom is 103 years old and still works full-time full at Seton Hall University. She starts her day at 8 a.m. at Mass, then she comes to her office, and she works till 4 o'clock each day. So Joe on the Board of Regents was uh, somebody who had tremendous institutional knowledge. Um, not only was he the first to raise his hand for search, uh, search committees, uh, but on the Committee on Regents, he attracted a group of people to the board that I think really was transformative. For many of us, he's the go-to guy when we're trying to figure out the solution to a big problem. He's the go-to guy when you need to have a sounding board for something that needs to remain confidential and something that needs creative, thoughtful, good advice. And I think that's how we all rely upon Joe and will continue to do so for a long time. Uh, his devotion to the school and the time he puts in uh, and with all his, uh, uh, his contacts in the community um, have certainly from the perspective of the law school uh, again brought it to uh, a different level, um, a higher level. Uh, it's a very well regarded uh, school. Um, incredible. I mean I can't think of a game that I haven't seen Joe at. Um, I can't think of a beefsteak dinner that he didn't attend and try to get many others to attend. Um, but Joe has been an incredible asset to the basketball program, um, always championing uh, and always you know, putting in his time, his talent and his treasure uh, to get behind you know, their initiatives. So again, just a tremendous, uh, tremendous character. Joe's leadership in athletics as chair of the subcommittee was instrumental in getting Seton Hall Athletics to the point it is today. 
Um, and I think uh, part of that has to do with uh, his upbringing. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of the impact on the school, I mean, just look around. I mean, um, I didn't go to Seton Hall, but certain, certainly Seton Hall is a wonderful institution. And with great athletics, basketball, baseball, soccer, you name it. So uh, I think his traits and his, you know, certainly his character, integrity, hard work have, have helped push the school and even, to even greater levels. I can't think of him not being in the Seton Hall Athletics Hall of Fame. He's just an incredible person. Um, there are a handful of people who have helped shape this school to what it is today over the last several decades. Um, and Joe is one of those three to five people. Um, you can't really think of anything that he hasn't been involved with, anything he hasn't touched, uh, and he's never shied away from leading anything. Um, so I think that he's absolutely well deserving of the award. Joe deserves to be in the Hall of Fame because Joe LaSala has been what Seton Hall is all about. Joe has given over 25 years of his life to this institution, helping through difficult times, helping in good times, been a major supporter of Pirate Blue Athletics when he was on the Board of Regents as the chair of, of the athletic department. I've never met an individual that cares more about Seton Hall University than Joe, Joe does. I'm very happy that my son started school here at Seton Hall. He became very famous and I got the job after that. I was very fortunate and we just love Seton Hall. Congratulations to Joe LaSalla for being inducted to the Hall of Fame. I love him, of course, my first son. It is an honor and a privilege for me to present to you for induction into the Seton Hall University Athletics Hall of Fame, Joel O'Sala. Good evening, good evening. It, it's very good to know that my mother knows my last name. <laughs> Executive Vice President Lyons, Reverend Clergy, members of the Board of Regents, faculty and administration of Seton Hall, Dean Kathleen Buzang, members, friends, and supporters of Pirate Blue, distinguished alumni, family, and friends all. Tonight, I am truly thrilled and humbled beyond words to be one of the 2019 inductees into the Seton Hall Athletics Hall of Fame. Please allow me to express my heartfelt appreciation to the Hall of Fame committee and to the university I love so much for honoring me tonight. There are many, many, many more, especially in this field, who are more deserving, and I truly appreciate being chosen among these wonderful inductees. <clears throat> in preparing for tonight, I felt that it was important to point out several critical things to you folks. I have never missed a foul shot. I have never dropped a fly ball or a boot at a grounder. I never failed to block a soccer shot on goal and have never once been called for a double dribble. And do you know why? Let me answer it, because I stink. Because as an athlete, I am an all-American <laughs> spectator. That is why the announcement had one honorary inductee among this athletic greatness, and why I am so thrilled to stand with them tonight. A special word of thanks to the four video stars who you just saw. Dean Buzang from our law school has in a very, very short time become a legend in the field of legal education. Mark Ganton, former president of your alumni association, longstanding, hardworking, and tremendously talented member of the Board of Regents and a friend I thank you, Mark. My partner, colleague, and friend, Bill O'Connor. He's an immensely gifted trial lawyer and friend. And finally, Al Frangillo, who is all things to scores of people. But to my family and me, he is the kindest, most caring, 
generous and loyal friend a person could ask for. Believe me, I know that. And there is no more avid and generous supporter of Pirate Blue Athletics in Seton Hall than Al. With Al, it is always give and never take. So to the four of you, thank you all so much for taking the time to do this for me and for fibbing to all these people. Over my more than 20 years as a regent and trustee here at Seton Hall, I was blessed to serve on a number of great committees with talented and dedicated people. But the best by far was chairing the athletic subcommittee for those seven years after serving on it for four or five as a um, regular old member, a rookie, as Larry pointed out. It was truly amazing to have a bird's eye view of what goes on at athletics at a major university like Seton Hall. It was just as amazing to have access to an athletic director like Larry Keaton who was absolutely at the top of his profession at that point. It provided a true fan like myself the opportunity to sit around after road games late in the evening and enjoy a cup of coffee with the likes of Richie Regan, Bill Rafferty, PJ, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Shepard, Phyllis Mangina, and Sue Regan, and so many others. What a blessing. The then enthusiasm of the entire Seton Hall community was contagious and especially fulfilling on the road where people bonded with a simple, single go, go Pirates. It was also amazing to go to our meetings and hear firsthand the report of nine NCAA tournament appearances, a Big East championship in men's basketball, men's golf, and women's track and field. All of this was done while never failing to focus on a full life for the student athletes and very careful attention to academics under the tutelage and mentoring of the great, great Robin Cunningham. Our committee meetings were sold out, all of them, every one of them. Leaders of the Seton Hall, New Jersey, and business communities made the time to help our committee, the likes of Bob Brennan, Frank Walsh, Bill Ayers, Ken Kunzman, who are thrilled is here tonight, Kurt Borowski, Phil McGee, George Ring, John Kelly, and on and on. Wasn't all fun and games, though. We had challenges to deal with as well. During those years, we lost Chancellor Patillo, welcomed Father Peterson, who had a different view about athletics, and then Monsignor Sheeran. We lost PJ. We lost Larry and others uh, as well, such as George Blaney and Tommy Emicker. Each challenge was met and dealt with by the superb committee with one primary objective, the best interest of Seton Hall and its students. All of this success and great fortune does not just happen. It requires hard and tedious work, time, talent, love, and support. That is why organizations like Pirate Blue are so critical. So please, as all of you have done so far, continue to support Pirate Blue, Seton Hall, and its programs so that Pat Lyons and his successors can maintain this valuable service and the traditions that Seton Hall is so deeply steeped in. A brief word of thanks, if I may, please, to those who have worked so hard to make this evening the grand event that it is. Uh, to Jay Judge, who knocked me off my chair with the, tele with the telephone call, who I know for the last many months has dedicated himself to the success of the dinner, from the planning, to the advertising, to the follow-ups, to the phone calls, to the emails, to the promptings. Thank you, Jay. To Al Frangillo and everyone at Gourmet Dining for their amazing attention to detail and to providing elegance and excellence. Thank you for this beautiful room and sumptuous dinner. To the Hall of Fame Committee, thank you for selecting someone as undeserving as myself. It is an overwhelming honor. And thank you for allowing me to share this evening with five true athletic Hall of Famers. Larry, I watched your achievements firsthand. They are the stuff of legends, just a couple. 10 Big East Tournament Championships, 15 NCAA appearances, an Elite Eight and a final game, a Sweet 16 in women's basketball, quarterfinals for men's soccer, the addition of the women's soccer team, the facility upgrades, the facility attention, the attention to students' needs, and on and on and on. Owen, Rich, Kadidre, and Laura, your individual biographies read like record books. I was never first in anything. But between and among you four, uh, you read things like, and I'm not going to say the names with them, you folks plug them in, first in goals, first in assists, rookie of the year, a leader in strikeouts, victories in complete games, drafted by the New York Yankees, who are not asleep right now, 
First NCAA appearance in 20 years. A leader in assists, points, steals, and free throws. Wow. All Big East Player of the Year. A leader in home runs, RBIs, average, doubles, and walks. Player of the Year, All Big East. Wow again. All of those accomplishments were done with dignity, grace, and academic achievement. Thank you all for allowing me to have a slice of this evening with you. Just a commercial for my firm. To, uh, to Ed Deutsch and all of my partners, colleagues, and friends at McElroy, Deutsch, Mulvaney, and Carpenter, I want to thank them for providing me with Bill O'Connor and with the perfect place to practice law. Their dedication to the practice of law as a profession is a source of daily inspiration for me, as is, like our student athletes honored here tonight, their work ethic and commitment to excellence. And finally, last but certainly, by no means least, to the Center of Life family, thank you. It is family who pays, the pr who pays the price for someone who is involved with work and then with worthwhile endeavors on top of work, such as board participations at a major university like this one. They are the ones at every game, show, recital, and event who have to look over their shoulders to the door to make sure you hustle in, if even at the last second. No one could be more blessed by family than me. Here tonight is my sainted sister, Judge Joanne, and my nephew, PJ Candido, and look out, Jay, PJ's taking over advancement down at Seton Hall Prep, and he's gonna be clipping at your heels. <laughs> You've already heard about my mother. She's a, a mere 102 years of age, and believe me, she's home chomping at the bit to get back at work. All she asks about is, when is Al going to call you? And I say, probably tomorrow. She doesn't believe me, but she is here in spirit. Uh, so many of you know her, and she sends her love to all of you. As exciting as it is going to a Seton Hall game, going to a Seton Hall game alone is not all that great. When you have the, go the opportunity to go with the lights of your life, your pride and joy, the excitement level peaks. For decades, I have been blessed by having our three sons interested in, and happy, actually, to go with their father to home games, away games, events, dinners, and anything pirate. They are here tonight in chronological order. There's Anthony here with Linda. Joseph, live from setting up this room for gourmet dining here with Caitlin, and Vincent. I cherish every one of those moments. I am immensely proud and love them. You make every day a great one. And finally, of course, to my wife, Deborah, of 39 plus years. She has been at about 1,000 Seton Hall events over the years. She comes happily, gracefully, and participates fully. Every moment of our life, to me, is like the first, pure magic. You are the beacon that leads our way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to each and every one of you, thank you so much for being here and for listening. You've made us very happy. Joe, congratulations. Thank you very much. Next up for men's soccer, Owen Monahan. I think if we could continue to recruit Owen Monahans to the program here at Seton Hall, it will be a phenomenal program for years to come. Owen was one of my first recruits. He's an amazing young man who played a major part in building a, a program that dominated the Big East. In his rookie year, he scored 10 goals and was honored as the Big East Freshman of the Year. Think about Owen and remember my time spent with him uh, here at Seton Hall. The, the first thing that comes to my mind is he had a powerful left foot. He was really, really uh, good on the left side of the field. Um, scored a lot of goals from the left side of the field. And I, I remember, uh, again, I was coming out of high school and he was already, had been here a year. And the first time I saw him kick a ball, I'm like, wow, I've never seen anything like it. But when he was running up that left side, there was no question that he was making an impact on the field. And there's no question that his left foot left an impact probably on a lot of goalkeepers. I know it did on my hands. Just phenomenal. I mean, look at the stats. 
right? Speaks for themselves. Scoring, passing. He had the overall game. He was, um, had the abilities of things you couldn't coach to a guy who's coming down the wing, who's coming at you at 90 miles an hour, putting defenders in their heels, and then the perfect pass. So both scoring and the ability to deliver the ball that makes it easy for other players to score. He was basically the full package. Uh, funny, compassionate, uh, hardworking, um, composed. One of the things that Owen was really good at on the soccer field, never got rattled. Wanted to win, competed hard, but never let you know, the opposition, you know, rattle him. He was very, very composed uh, as a soccer player and even composed, uh, you know, uh, as a person. He, you rarely see Owen in a bad mood. Just as a person, fantastic, a great friend, loyal, always there for you, always want to be helpful. He is a, a character. Uh, he is a brother. Um, he will make you laugh which is probably the best and most pure characteristic of Owen Monaghan, um, which we all thoroughly enjoy. Leave him alone with somebody for 10 minutes at an event, come back, and they're laughing. And Owen has that ability to connect. As they say, some people like to be liked. Owen is just likable from the day you meet him. Whether you know, we were winning, whether we were losing, halftime, um, you know, he was always just positive. Always, you know, kind of you know, wanting everybody to kind of pick it up a little bit and, and knew how to uh, um, uh, kind of motivate uh, players around him, not only by his actions, uh, but, but by his words. Owen was always a very hard worker, um, and uh, I think he became a role model over time for everyone. Um, it didn't take long for you to understand what was inside the person and what his contributions to the team would be and to the university overall. Uh, winning games is easy. Losing games is difficult, but he always put the good side on it, even with the losses. So when you sat down and had a beer with him, uh, you would say, well, Mono, today, were you off a little bit? And he'd go, no, just not as brilliant as usual. <laughs> so my freshman year, my first year here, was the 88-89 uh, season, which I believe uh, depending on who you talk to, might, might be uh, regarded as one of the most successful teams, successful seasons in Seton Hall soccer history. And what stands out in my memory of my freshman year was watching, you know, guys like Pat O'Kelly and Ian Hennessy and certainly Owen Monahan as part of that core group that really led that whole team, that whole season. And uh, I believe uh, you know, we made it to the quarterfinals of the, of the NCAAs. I think we were ranked number three in the nation. And, uh, and certainly, Owen had as big a part to that successful season as anybody else. Well, that was uh, the third Big East championship, I believe, that we won with Owen on the field. Um, so we were in a set of transformation. Uh, and and you, know, you had to come in and play at a caliber uh, to participate. And obviously, he did from day one. And he contributed to that. But I think there's more to a Hall of Fame person than just, you know, what happens on the field. I think it's the, the entire package. And again, I can't, I can't say it uh, enough. Uh, he was as good as teammate as there is. I've been around soccer, I've been around teams all my life, and there is no better teammate uh, than Owen. He made everybody around him better. He helped everybody. He was great in the locker room. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when he brought uh, his talent on the field, he raised uh, everybody's level of play all around him. The stats speak for themselves. Uh, he's also a leader. Um, people looked up from him, young players who came in. Uh, he took them under his arm and um, helped them and was just an integral part of the program. Um, he was a supporter to all the athletes. So, absolutely the most deserving guy to be there. And I believe if you look at Owen's four years here, uh, I think you can probably say it might have been some of the best four years in Seton Hall soccer history. It is an honor and privilege for me to present to you for induction into the Seton Hall University Athletics Hall of Fame, my good friend, Owen Monaghan.
Good evening. Those pictures were about 50 pounds ago. <laughs> I've been fighting to get back there ever since. Anyway, I just wanted to thank um, Ed, Tommy, Peter, and Martin for your kind words. Uh, they mean a lot. Um, I just also want to thank the support that I have tonight from neighbors over here, co-workers and friends, and my buddies at the soccer team. So thank you. Um, I just want to begin by congratulating my fellow inductees. I'm very proud to be honored alongside such a very impressive group. I also would like to thank Seton Hall University for giving me this great distinction. The university means so much to me. It really focused on making education the cornerstone of the student athlete's life, and I'm very proud to be a pirate. For me, it all started with a ball in the streets and in the fields in a small town in Ireland called Bray County Wicklow. Like most kids, I had a passion for football, or as we would say here, soccer. I played for one of the top teams in Ireland, Shamrock Rovers, and I always dreamt of going east to play in England, but instead I headed west to an incredible new opportunity. I left Wicklow, which is called the Garden of Ireland, and I came here to New Jersey, the Garden State. <laughs> in 1987, Ed Kelly, our Seton Hall coach, offered me a chance to get an education and to play the sport I loved. And it changed my life immeasurably, and I'm forever grateful, Ed, thank you. If it wasn't for my mother Daphne's selfless encouragement, I wouldn't be here today. She was my drive and my inspiration. When I came here to this new country, I didn't know what to expect, and I wondered if I had made the right decision. But when I arrived here at Seton Hall, the community embraced me. So, when I sat here to write this speech, I asked myself one question. How did this community at Seton Hall play a part in who I am today? And the more I looked at it, and the more I looked at my life, the more I realized that all roads led back to here, 400 South Orange Avenue. This road led me to my family life. My beautiful wife, Margaret, is a pirate. We were friends from freshman year. We dated our senior year. And when I proposed to her, it was right here at the soccer field. This road enriched my faith. Having a Catholic background and being so far away from home, I found comfort in our Seton Hall Chapel. Father Morley was our dormitory priest and we became great friends and we're still close to this day. Father Morley participated in our wedding and he baptized my Matthew and Rose, right here in the chapel. This road led me to value friendships. My closest friends, my lifelong friends are Setonians. You are such a huge part of my life and I love you all dearly. I always look forward to meeting up for dinner, drinks, and attending a basketball or soccer game. We have celebrated our weddings, watched our children grow, and now we see them preparing for college and life. It's all coming full circle. This road led me to a lifelong mentor. The first day I arrived, I met Jerry and Anna Marie Murphy. They became my American family. Jerry worked at Career Services and guided me into a new, a, uh, excuse me, that guided me into a business major, a fellow alum and a trusted friend. This road led me to my first job working summers and college breaks, painting for another pirate, Martin Murphy. I believe everybody at these two tables here worked for Martin in the past. <laughs> but Martin is a great supporter of Seton Hall, an even better friend. This road led me to my career. I was hired into my career as a financial advisor 26 years ago by Dave D'Arcangelo. 
We've been together ever since. He has guided me through many, uh, guided me throughout my career and is a dedicated Seton Hall alum. And finally, the Seton Hall soccer team. It was a great team to play with during my four years. I believe we were that winning team because of our closeness and that bond brought, us, brought the best out in everyone. We achieved so much together. We had four Big East appearances, two championships. The team won the Big East the year before I came and they also won a year after I graduated. It was great to be part of something special. We were ranked third in the nation. Our winning record in my four years was an impressive 51, 23, and six. We were 18 and two in the Big East. We had three NCAA appearances. It was a privilege to play alongside some of the greatest players Seton Hall has ever produced. Even though I'm being honored here tonight, it would not have been possible without my teammates. So I dedicate this night to you. Go Pirates. Congratulations, Owen. Next up from the baseball program, Rich Scheid. Uh, I'm a recruiter. I've been recruiting now for a number of years. And when I go and see, and see big you know, left-handed pitchers, um, I always think of Richie Scheid. I could tell by the by uh, the first day that Rich came in here that uh, that he he has a lot of ability. You know, he was tall, thin, lanky guy, left-hander, and um, and you could tell that he could pitch. Well, he was a, a quiet leader right from the first day that he stepped on campus. He was very committed. He set goals for himself that rubbed off on the entire team, myself included. Uh, going from his freshman year, he was a tall, slender you know, toothpicky looking guy. Uh, and he came back his sophomore year and he was built up and he really took it to working out and strength training and all that other stuff that makes you a quality athlete. As good as you think you are, you know, personally, um, there were some things about Richie that just, you know, every teammate uh, knew. When, uh, uh, when you saw him uh, uh, warm up in a bullpen or in a game and you saw him throw his curveball, um, it was just a very different level. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, the bullpen was tucked away in the right corner and the soccer goals would be disassembled and all the pipes would be sitting there and I'd look out in the bullpen and there's Richie with this long pipe over his shoulders doing uh, lunges, you know, he's picking up big stones and doing arm exercises and it was just really interesting to see how he took to the rigors of baseball and how he was able to use his surroundings and, you know, just use it to his advantage. I mean, watching him operate was, was a good thing for the entire baseball program. His former coach, Shep, was talking about my dad's potential to be a first round draft and Coach Shep said he was the best left-hander in the East with a dangerous 90 mile per hour fastball that led him in 117 strikeouts that season. And Shep said, Rich does all of the little things and that really stuck with me because I know that my dad works so hard and practiced every day to be the absolute best that he could be. Very quiet. Very quiet when he first came in here. The one thing that I, re that I remember about Rich when, uh, when he first came in is he didn't speak. He didn't speak for probably a month and a half or so that, that he was here. You know, eventually I think uh, what we did to loosen him up a little bit is we wanted to take him to the pub. <laughs> and he, he could eat. You know, he was tuned into, like I said, the strain training, the conditioning, but also the diet factor. And he'd be sitting there with a mound of carrots. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching him eat. And I'm like, Richie, what's with all the carrots? He's like, got to be able to see that strike zone. But I remember uh, in 1985 that uh, it could have been Easter weekend, we were playing Pittsburgh, and uh, I came up with a, uh, uh, a bum ankle and couldn't pitch. Uh, first time probably ever. So, um, so Richie uh, went and pitched the first game that weekend, 
and the first game was always like a seven inning game. And so not only did he have a complete game, but Richie also started the second game. Um, so he, he picked me up like he always picked the team up. And um, uh, that, was, that was really impressive because I, I think Richie went on to, to pitch at least three more innings of the second game. And he was just, he was unhittable. But what stands out most is in 1984, we were up in Maine. That was my junior year, Rich was a freshman. And um, he, we won, I think, 41 or 42 games that year. It was one game, uh, uh, it was the finals, and it was uh, the winner goes to Omaha, goes to the College World Series. We thought, or the coaches thought so much of Rich at that point that Rich actually got the final game start against Maine, up in Maine. And he pitched extremely well. And he kept us in the game the entire time. We lost the game, but it wasn't Rich's fault. We didn't, we didn't give him any uh, run production, but that's how much they thought of Rich to give him the uh, starting role in that, uh, that final game to get us to the World Series. That one game, I think, was huge not only for the university, but also for Richie Scheid. So in big games, um, uh, he, was just, uh, he was just always there for us. And the impact that he had on the program was taking the traditions that were in place and just doing it. You know, he really was a no-nonsense guy. He still is. If you talk to him, you'll realize, you know, he's a no-nonsense guy and he just likes to get the job done. Not a whole lot of fanfare. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to hear what he has to say tonight. He's done a lot in his career. He's done all, he's done all he can in baseball. You know, Rich was an All-American here. Rich was uh, uh, played on Team USA. Um, set all kinds of records at Seton Hall, played in the major leagues. I mean, there's nothing much more uh, he could have done in baseball. One thing that uh, I, I'd be remiss not to mention is uh, uh, that Shep would be so, you know, so proud uh, uh, to see Richie go into, uh, into the Hall of Fame. And, uh, and Rich was, you know, every bit the player that, uh, uh, that Shep, you know, loved uh, in the program. My dad is an extremely driven, determined and inspiring person and he's dedicated his life to the sport of baseball and his love for the sport is truly special and it has been an amazing opportunity to see him dedicate his time coaching and mentoring young athletes over the years. On the field he was like I said a, a guy that you would watch, a guy that you would want to be like not only for our upperclassmen but also the freshman class that came in Richie took them under their wing, he treated them really well, he showed them the different aspects of what it's like to be a pirate. So he embodies all that Seton Hall baseball is all about. It is an honor and privilege for me to present to you for induction into the Seton Hall University Athletics Hall of Fame, the Red Rocket, my dad, Rich Scheid. Larry, PJ, great to see you. It's been a, been a long, long time, so. I'll get you guys back after, after the event, so. <laughs> Some of those comments in there, but. It's a great honor to be recognized here tonight, and first and foremost, congratulations to all the 2019 Hall of Fame inductees. Over the past 30 years, I've attended many seat hall events and have met some great people who have had an impact both on and off the field to the success of Seton Hall. Along with my former teammates tonight, coaches here tonight, I'd like to congratulate Phyllis Shepard on last year's induction. As since my first very first time on a campus back in 84, all the events you've been to, road trips, um, golf outings, I really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much. I'd like to personally thank Jay Judge, Rob Shepard, Pat Lyons on a consideration and nomination of me joining such a great group of individuals who have been recognized for their achievements and commitment to Seton Hall Athletics. I became familiar with Seton Hall growing up on Staten Island. 
I guess, early in my high school years, uh, there was always some players from Seton Hall who had some tremendous success here. So you could always read about them in the Staten Island Advance. You were over there. So uh, one day I remember uh, Seton Hall and Wagner on the back page of uh, the sports section. There was a big article about a game they played. It was a picture of a bunch of p players on top of one another. A brawl erupted during a game. Um, I think Shep was right in the middle of it from what I remember seeing. And I think we can get that photo from maybe a Jay Price or somebody over there someday. So over the years, Staten Island has seen a number of players go on and have great success here at the university. And I hope that trend continues. My decision to come to Seton Hall was an easy one for me after meeting Ed Blankmar in June of my senior year after pitching a game at Tottenville High School. I did have some other offers, but it, about a week or so later, Shep came to my house I signed her a letter of an intent and a full scholarship to play baseball at Seton Hall. Making a transition to Division I baseball is sometimes a big adjustment for a big, uh, young athlete, but I was very fortunate to have played at a great high school baseball program on the island, which prepared me for playing at the next level. At the time I came on campus, the only, th as you've heard from a couple of these guys here, the only thing I needed to know was when I was scheduled to pitch, what dorm was I gonna live in, and what time the cafeteria opened up. <laughs> For a period of time, I had no understanding of proper study habits and commitment in a, required in a classroom. Sorry, Katie. Until I bought into Mike Shepard's constant reminder to go to every class, do all the work, and ask for help. I will, I will always appreciate an, the encouragement that Shep and Ed Blankmeyer gave me towards finally completing my college degree several years into my professional baseball career. When, you, when your major league career ends, you do one of two things. You stay in the game in some capacity or you change, complete, change careers completely. I chose the latter. It's had a big impact on what I do today. There was certainly a lot of talent on the teams I played for in the mid-80s. Some of them are here tonight that had an impact on me. Former major leaguer and 84 Olympic team member Pat Pasillo. I was able to follow in his footsteps and play on Team USA in 95 after my sophomore year. Phil Kandari, an outstanding college coach, high draft pick, and who in the first year of Big East Conference gave me incentive every weekend series, as he mentioned on the video, to follow up one of his great pitching performances with one of my own. Doug Sinella, he was a workhorse, we were both drafted in 1986, and, and he pitched during that summer in 86, he pitched one of his back-to-back no-hitters against me in our first year professional baseball. He was playing with the Orioles A-ball team. I was with the Oneonta Yankees Farm Club, and um, I think the game ended in one nothing, and he pitched another no-hitter next week. So thanks for, all, thanks for everybody for being here tonight. Ed Blankmeyer is here tonight encouraged me to think big of playing in the major leagues. A tremendous teacher and recruiter guided me and countless other players through playing in the right summer leagues for pro baseball exposure. We all owe him a debt of gratitude towards his commitment to this program while he was here. I'd like to get that wedding photo of uh, when, you guys, when you and Susan were walking down to, out of the, the, the chapel and Shep got six of us to put on our baseball uniforms, walk across campus. They were coming out of chapel. He had six wooden bats, and we, three of us started on each side. So I was like, what are you asking us to do? What are we doing? <laughs> but Mike Shepard, what can you say about him that hasn't already been said? I'll never forget him and the opportunity he gave me. Always there for me, whether it was my contract negotiations with the Yankees being locked up in that seminary building across from the baseball field here on campus with Yankee front office people when I first signed in 86, making it easy for me to register for fall classes to complete my degree. I was speaking to Rob Shepard a couple weeks ago when I was up here. My daughter was playing in a uh, state softball tournament we really talked about, we talked about a few things, but I think some kind of coming up with some kind of a deserving award in Mike Shepard's honor. Mike was, a, Shep was a walk-on, try to find, an, come up with an award for a deserving 
senior who's graduating, who's a walk-on, who's excelled on a field and in a classroom. I think it would be something we can really uh, maybe present at the annual golf outing on a yearly basis that can ho honor his legacy. I'd like to see 500 people at the, the golf outing next fall. I think it's I think definitely doable with uh, trying to do something like that. <laughs> my family's here tonight. My wife, Roberta, always there with me during my baseball career and still to this day, dealing with all the twists and turns of playing professional baseball, moving to a new city, packing and unpacking a new par apartment, making unexpected travel arrangements, traveling with traveling to winter ball in Venezuela with a two-year-old. My younger daughter, Katie, who will be the maid of honor for her older daughter's wedding August 4th, who was on the, who was on the video. I enjoyed putting this speech together tonight, but I'll have a bigger, it's a little more pressure on me next, uh, about six weeks from now with, with uh, Brianna's, so. My brother, Chris, his two boys, one of which attends Seton Hall Prep, I told, I told him to work on his golf game this summer. He's a member over at Springbrook. If you go over to Springbrook and play, and you need a good caddy, go into the clubhouse and ask for Lucas. <laughs> my parents are here tonight, always supportive of me and my baseball career, always travel to Seton Hall games, was sitting next to Phyllis Shepard back in the 80s and back in Orno, Maine. They always followed my career and my teammates. There is nothing more important that a parent can do to encourage her and support your kids when they are doing something they love. And my parents have been doing that ever since day one. Mike Shepard. <laughs> Mike Shepard had his famous saying, never lose your hustle. Well, after tonight, I'll never lose mine for Seton Hall. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Rich. Next up from women's basketball, Khadija Simmons. There isn't one person that's had more influence than a basketball program in the 28 years I've been the head coach. the epitome of a student athlete. Um, she took a lot of pride in the classroom and on the court. Uh, she was a great teammate, um, very coachable, you know, a good friend. Um, being from, from Newark, New Jersey, you know, she had a family around all the time. So she took a lot of pride in being a student athlete at, at Seton Hall. Uh, when she got to high school, you know, academically she was focused. You know, there was never a situation where you had to discipline her. She understood, you know, I, I ran a type program where it was about books and ball, and the program was one that did well because we worked really hard, and she fit right into that mold, and she was very focused. There were always, always A's for Dee Dee. You know, shows up on time, respectful to her teachers, respectful to her tutors. Um, you know, she was the ultimate student athlete here at Seton Hall. Dee Dee was um, a leader, very passionate, um, a competitor, um, loyal. She was a great friend, um, uh, very family oriented. She cared about the people around her, um, just fierce. Like she, you know, hard nose, do whatever it takes to get the job done. Dee Dee's work ethic was something that set her apart. Um, she didn't miss one rep. She was always early. She always stayed late. She cared very much. But her work ethic, day in and day out, to be the best she could be, but more importantly, to get the team to be the best they could be, was really what set her apart from all others. She's just tough, and she just stays focused, and she's always learning, you know, she's always looking in the right direction to how to get to where she wants to get. Just that drive alone, you know, and she stays humble. You know, she's very appreciative, and uh, when she goes for it, she goes for it. Dee Dee was very um, passionate about basketball. She was passionate about um, competing every day and um, being on the floor and 
uh, being a good teammate and being a leader and carrying her team, um, she took a lot of pride in that. And um, that was something that we, we loved about her and uh, we continue to love about her to this day. Just watching her leadership and, you know, there were times that I missed it, you know, because I, I had it, I had opportunity to benefit from it and how she would just drive teams. You know, uh, point guards are that other coach all the time out there and just her focus and directing the offense and pushing people to be tough on defense and making others play. Even if it was about the numbers were bigger than hers, it didn't matter. She always pushed her teammates to be as good as they could be so that everybody could be benefits of it. And I saw that there and I saw it here. And I was just really proud of her to know that she just still had that fight in her. Dee Dee overcame so much, tearing her ACL, being coached by three different head coaches, being a co coached by eight different assistant coaches. And every single time and every single person she treated with respect, dignity, and gave 100% effort all the time. And that's why she is who she is. And that's why she's a Hall of Famer. The Big East was really like one of the top conferences in the country, if not one of the best. Um, and she came in with an attitude, with a chip on her shoulder, knowing that she wanted to take our program to another level. And she did that every day in practice. She did that during games. Um, and, you know, she was competing against the best players in the country. And you could tell that she, you know, she wanted to elevate the program to another level. She did that with the way she played and the way she carried herself every day. Uh, sometimes you see players of that size, and it's like, oh, they're really good, but they're small. But you never saw small in her, and to have to compete in the Big East was like a real challenge. And uh, she just took it chest out, like, I'm ready, because that's what she loved. She loved to compete. So the bigger the game, the bigger she would always play. And we won the all-time great game at Butler, down nine with under a minute to go. You know what? I'll never forget all those huddles and all those timeouts in that last minute. Dee Dee's like, we got this, Coach B. We got this team. We got this. We got this. We got this. And she did. She willed us to it. And I don't even know if she made more than one basket in that run. I think we scored 15 or 16 points. But you know what? She was out there for every second of it, encouraging her teammates, setting them up, playing defense, doing everything. So it wasn't about just points to her. It was about us winning the game. And winning that regular season meant so much to our program and, and, and all the hard work that we had done for the two years at that point. And, you know, as great as it is to win a, a tournament championship, winning the regular season is just as hard, if not harder, because you have to do it over 18 games. And to win it in the fashion that we did, winning at the Hall a couple weeks before and then winning, you know, at Butler down nine with under a man to go, says a lot about our team, but really our captain, which was Dee. Dee Dee deserves to be in the Hall of Fame because she's a proven winner. She is one of the hardest workers I know. She's put, you know, the program Seton Hall Women's Basketball um, on her back during her time at Seton Hall, and she took it from um, being at the bottom of the conference to the top. Um, she carries herself in a way every day that we as coaches want to see our players uh, represent their programs, represent their team, um, and represent herself and her family. Um, she's definitely uh, taken herself to another level. Dee Dee deserves to be in the Seton Hall Athletics Hall of Fame because of what she accomplished both on and off the court. And one of the proudest moments I remember and when I know that Dee Dee had made the difference that she wanted to make was in 2015 when she brought the program to the level that we had once been at, the NCAA tournament. And she was introduced in the starting lineup against Rutgers as the last person out there. And I just knew at that point she had accomplished what she wanted. Not for herself to be in the NCAA tournament, but for Seton Hall women's basketball team to be in the NCAA tournament, to be relevant. It is an honor and privilege for me to present to you for induction into the Seton Hall University Athletic Hall of Fame. Khadija Simmons. Congrats, Dee Dee.
That was touching. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I would like to congratulate my fellow Hall of Fame class of 2019. I know you all worked extremely hard to receive this prestigious recognition. I'm honored to share this night with you all and also with my family and friends. I would first like to thank Seton Hall University, Seton Hall University Athletics, Seton Hall University Administration, as well as our alumni who have been extremely supportive throughout the years. My journey here at Seton Hall all started with a phone call from assistant coach Brian Stanchek and countless face-to-face -face conversations with head coach Phyllis Mangino. She's here today. I thank you and your staff for seeing my potential and recognizing my talents to play basketball in the Big East at a very high level. You all granted me the opportunity to hire my education at one of the top academic universities in the world. My family and I are forever grateful. Because of Phyllis Mangina stepping down as head coach, I wasn't able to experience playing for her and her staff. But it didn't stop her from every time seeing me to tell me the things that I needed to prove to improve on my game. Shortly after her departure, I received a phone call from Coach Ty, which you all saw in the video, and Coach Ann Donovan. It didn't take many words from Coach Donovan to convince me at giving her a chance to coach me and to stick to my commitment here at Seton Hall and see this journey through. I can't thank Coach Donovan and her staff enough for the three years they spent molding me into the basketball player that I became. During her first year at Seton Hall, I received Big East All Freshman Honors and a highly competitive conference against some of the best athletes in all of basketball. Her staff was so hard on me, and I now understand why. They saw greatness in me and held me to a standard that I grew to appreciate. Coach Donovan taught me leadership, how to hold myself accountable, how to demand more from myself and others. She gave me the courage, hope, wisdom, and the confidence I needed to lead this program to successful seasons. Coach Donovan's teachings, her words, her love will forever live through me. May her soul rest in peace. Coach Tony Bazella, who I call Coach B, came back to his beloved alma mater to continue building what the coaches here before him started. Coach B and his staff came in with an open mind and believed that we could win with the current players we had. His belief and style of play ignited many postseason appearances and allowed me to receive national recognition. During Coach B's first year, we made it to the Sweet 16 round of the WNIT. And, and in year two, we made it to the NCAA tournament for the first time in 20 years. <laughs> I also received All-American honors and that's just a testament to the amount of dedication they gave to the program, as well as us as players. I would like to thank the following. Coach Falk, I never told you how much I cherished our film sessions, our pregame shoot arounds we had together before every home game and away game. You've always supported me along the way and it meant so much to me. Coach Nick, who wasn't able to make it today, he shared his knowledge and experience of the game with me and it helped expand my basketball intelligence. Flag, who never said no to the countless of individual workouts I requested. I mean, two workouts a day outside of team practices and lift sessions. Because of you, I've elevated my game to a level far beyond my imaginations. Coach B, thank you for allowing me to be myself and trusting my talents. Coach B, thank you for allowing me to be myself and trusting my talents and my ability to lead your team without question. Before every home game 
oh, before every game, you told me that I was the best player on the court. You said it because you believed it, and I hope I, I was able to perform as such. I believe every coach I've encountered played the role for me being up here tonight. Not just my college coaches, but my high school coach and AAU coaches as well. Vanessa Watson, who was in the video. My high school coach, such an amazing person, very smart, wise, a brilliant basketball mind, um, and has a smile that warms my heart every time I see her. She's a winner, and she's instilled that in me. Paul McPleasant, who wasn't able to make it tonight, I thank him for introducing me to the game of basketball. AAU coaches, Ches Williams, Walter Welsh, put me on top platforms to showcase my talents and to receive a basketball scholarship. This night isn't just about myself, but also about everyone who helped me along the way. My teammates for supporting me on and off the court. I thank them for trusting me to be their leader. Our managers for being very solid and supportive through the wins and losses. When we gave you all attitudes because we, we weren't trying to, because you were trying to give us a towel or our water bottles when we didn't ask. And lastly, my family, who's here tonight, over there. Um, my mom, my dad, I mean, you guys are the best parents anybody can ever ask for. Um, Dad, you set the bar extremely high. You're the perfect example of what a man looks like. My mom, who has been supportive throughout the way, along the way, um, I remember you quitting your second job just to come to our basketball games. And um, you've been to every single one, as well as my dad. Um, I can't thank you, you both enough. I mean, without you, I wouldn't be here. My grandmother, you're my love, my rock, my soul, and I love you to death. My brother, I don't know what he, this guy, <laughs> thanks to him, I mean, basketball all day, all night in the backyard. He's bullying me. He's cheating me. <laughs> um, but it was just tough love. And I mean, you instilled that in me from day one. And I mean, I can't thank you enough. Every park we walked in, everywhere we went, you picked me to be on your team. I appreciate you. <laughs> My sister, my twin sister, yes, I have a twin sister. We're a minute apart. <laughs> she actually played basketball at LIU. Um, we've been on the court since we were, what, eight, nine. And my sister never really said much, but when I came to her for pro with problems and when I doubted myself, she would just look at me and tell me, I know you can do it. Just go out there and do it. And I just knew what that meant and where it was coming from. And as for Seton Hall University, I mean, I would love to put that jersey on one more time and relive our greatest moments, the wins, the losses. I mean, my love, my dedication, my loyalty for this program will forever remain. And I can only aspire to continue to be around, to pour and pour and pour my everything into this program because this is home for me and I appreciate you all greatly. Thank you. Didi, congratulations. I'm sure Coach wishes you still had some eligibility left as well. <laughs> Last but certainly, certainly not least from our softball program, Laura Taylor. Um, every at-bat with Taylor was a moment waiting to happen, whether 
it ended in the long ball going over the fence or a teaser almost over the fence. Um, you were waiting to see what Taylor was going to do with her at bat. Well, speaking to the uh, student part, she was an excellent student. You know, she uh, was part of the Big East uh, all-academic team all four years she was here. So she was a really good student. And athlete, she was one of the best. She was the one that was always staying after practice, always taking extra swings, always trying to perfect her game. She was one of the very best that came from Seton Hall. Laura is, a, is an amazing friend. She's like the definition, you know, maybe her picture is next to that, to that word in the dictionary. She just is somebody that you could call, she lives in Florida now, you could call and she would do everything in her power to be there for you. And I, I think that's true of a lot of us, but um, you know, she is silly when she needs to be, but she's also extremely serious and very dedicated to what she does. Uh, Taylor as a freshman, very mature, you know, she, she was all business and she fit right in. It wasn't like a freshman coming in who was immature or you had to keep tabs on or, you know, who had to earn their way. She came in, she earned her way by walking through the door and, and showing what she had. Uh, her ability to turn a game around, you know, with one swing of a bat. You can see the whole team was up on the fence, which we were most of the time anyway, but the expectation was there and she delivered a majority of the time with, you know, home runs. Her freshman year, I think she hit 18 and um, I believe it was uh, the record in the NCAA for home runs per at bat. I mean, she would just hit frozen ropes at people, and w if she wasn't hitting a line drive at somebody, it was some of them were these like arcing moon shots that went 400 feet, and you just couldn't believe that somebody could hit a ball that far. And some were just like smoked line drives over the center field fence where the outfielder didn't even turn around and run after the ball. No matter what. Taylor is doing in her life. She's, she's extremely dedicated. So when she was a student athlete at Seton Hall, she was a phenomenal student. She was a phenomenal player and she was always committed to doing the best at whatever she was doing. And it's no surprise that she's being inducted to the Hall of Fame because she doesn't do anything half-ass. She goes for it all the way. She was the one taking swings after practice, going in early. Um, making sure that her grades were up. She was, she was so dedicated to um, Seton Hall and her academics and her um, athletics, and I really appreciate that about her. I think one of the things that made her such a good leader on the field is if we were in a tough spot or, um, you know, our back was against the wall at some point in time, I was t more typically the person that would call a timeout from a catcher spot, but she, mo she always seemed to know what to say to everybody to kind of get them to settle down, and that was just another prototypical Taylor thing to do. I would say she was a great lead actor with a great supporting cast um, with those years of players. They won, they won two Big East championships. They had a great pitcher in Meg Meyer, and uh, I think Taylor, you know, with her presence was scary in the lineup. And then you had everybody else that was filling their spots. And I think that she changed the expectation and the tone of the program and created a level that everyone had to, to rise up to. The other thing about Laura, I mean, she loved to play this game. I mean, it wasn't, you know, she's still doing it today and she's teaching the game. She owns a, a, a training outfit down in Florida and uh, you know, she trains young girls. So I think that speaks to her leadership that she wants to pay it forward. You know, she learned a lot. She came in as a great athlete. She learned more here and she wants to give it to the next generation. Aside from being a total powerhouse hitter, as we all know, was the fact that she made all of us better. She was, she was so good and so effective and always making things happen in the game that she inevitably, inevitably brought everybody up with her. She was a leader from the time she set foot on the field as a freshman. She was um, always a captain-like uh, player on the team, even as one of the youngest players. And I remember you know, that carried on and she eventually did become a captain. So um, I think overall her leadership was probably the biggest impact that she made on the field at Seton Hall. 
Well, she was a big impact player, um, and she was a part of a, a team that was, you know, legendary, basically. Two back-to-back -back, um, Big East championships, and she was one of the leaders of those teams, and, uh, you know, without her, I don't think that we would have reached that plateau. She is someone who will never be forgotten, won't be outdone as an offensive player in the history books of Seton Hall softball. She is someone who you would want on any program in the, in the country, and I think that we were lucky to have her come to Seton Hall. You know, I think she is the statistical leader in most hitting categories that we have at Seton Hall University. Um, that in and of itself, I think, should be a prerequisite. But she, you know, she was the Big East Player of the Year, but when she walked in a room, you, she never um, made that who she was. She just was your friend, your, your um, teammate, and those are the things that, you know, I think being a Hall of Famer is more about representing the university and you had individual achievements, but she made our team better because she was on there. It is an honor and a privilege for me to present to you for induction into the Seton Hall University Athletics Hall of Fame. Laura Taylor. Worry, it's just one page. <laughs> one page. Um, good evening, good night. Um, to Pat Lyons, thank you. Um, to all the distinguished guests and the fellow inductees. I've been dreaming of this speech. I, of course, wanted to be the first player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame that played softball, but. You know what they say about good pitching, good, good hitting, good pitching's gonna win most of the time, so Megan Meyer, you won. <laughs> but I'm happy to have lost that battle to her because she's, pitching is everything. Um, the decisions that we make per propel us where we're meant to go in life and because of my decision to attend Seton Hall. I'm an entrepreneur, a wife, a leader of future leaders, and a mentor. But I think most importantly, I'm a teammate. That's one of the greatest honors of my life. I mean, as you saw, I had some of the smartest, funniest, most talented teammates anyone could ask for. In my graduating class alone, there's a PhD, there's two attorneys and there's three MBAs. And that's not to mention the doctor and the engineer and all the teachers and the athletic trainers and the pharmaceutical reps. But their greatness and their push for greatness in their own lives and on our team helped push me in, this, in that same direction and I could not have been more thankful for that. I was and continue to be successful because of the people around me. I had three coaches that were on staff all four years that I was in college. And those two assistants went on to become Big East head coaches. Coach Vandermeer believed in me enough to give me a chance to play that first weekend out in 2002. And that was after mono, a broken foot, a twisted ankle. I mean, I barely practiced my freshman year. And, and and yet he gave me a shot. Coach Nelson, who you saw in the video, would throw countless hours of extra BP in the cages, and thank goodness he's retired now, so we don't have to talk about countable hours. Um, and then Coach G, who was our first base coach, he would pick location, which means to tell the hitter whether it's gonna be inside or outside, and in baseball, that's a big no-no, because that'll get you, I mean, I'm sure you threw it, several people who did that. Um, but we had our little code, and I'm telling you, out of those home runs, I would say 60, 70%, I knew what pitch was coming. 
which makes it a lot easier to hit. I was surrounded in the lineup by hitters that would get on base so I could hit them in, and hitters behind me that would force teams to pitch to me even if they didn't want to. And then, of course, Megan Meyer, who would strike people out so that I wouldn't have to try to field ground balls at first base, <laughs> which is really important because I was a catcher in high school. My parents. There aren't many people who can say they have four parents who love them with all their hearts and truly help mold them into the person that they are today. My mom and my stepdad brought me on my recruiting trip and like every single travel ball tournament and helped me make the most important decision of my life at the time in picking Seton Hall. Thank you both for being here. Jean Marie, I'm so glad that you met my dad. You've had a really big <laughs> impact on my life. So thank you for being here as well. All right, here's the hard part. Um, there are, there's so many people to thank that help, that really helped me choose Seton Hall, but this decision, believe it or not, is rooted in 1993 or 94. While I wouldn't be a freshman, until the fall of 2001. Unfortunately, my dad passed away about five years ago. But I couldn't help but share this story with you because it sticks with me over 25 years later. When I was 10 or 11, I took my first trip to Seton Hall with my dad. He was scouting for the Yankees at the time and he was coming to scout the Pirates. So luckily, I got to tag along. So we're driving up South Orange Avenue from the parkway, and he casually says to me, well, you're not going to school here. He really wanted me to go to Duke, but they didn't have softball, so that was easy, you know, easy decision there. So like many good girls, I defied my father six or seven years later when I made one of the best decisions of my life to become a pirate. All right. Luckily, Coach V had us drive in from 280 because I'd forgotten about that trip completely. I was a little kid and I fell in love with the campus and the people and the proximity of the city. I would also like to thank so many people that influenced me along the way at Seton Hall. A lot of them are here right now. My buddy, Kim Jackson, who you saw on the video, she was my host on my visit and my teammate for just one year, unfortunately, because she's really old. And she's been my best friend ever since. Um, my roommate, Darcy Kellerman. My roommate on the road, Meg Berry. So many of my teammates that are here tonight, and I know, I know that there's a lot of you that wanted to make it. Trot, Pierce, Mac, Jenna, Schulz, DP, Kate Flynn, Akua, and so many others. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank my wife for supporting me in the business that we've built together. I naively thought as a 20, 21 year old that the 2004, 2005 Big East Championships that my team and I, we, we won. They were the greatest accomplishments of our lives because no one had done it before. But that would all come in 2014 when in a matter of a week, I quit my job, I got married, and I started a new business. No big deal, seven days, not a big deal. But together, we have taken that business from softball lessons in a county park to opening a multi-million dollar sports training facility that we have dubbed the most unique sports experience in Jacksonville, Florida. You'll have to come on down and check out why. I could not have had the courage to quit my job without her support. And when my father grew sicker, I left Florida to be with him. And she ran the business on her own while working full time during the day. Now we are the teammates. <laughs> on a daily basis. And I can honestly say I would not have been able to do that and I wouldn't have been prepared without my time at Seton Hall. So thank you so much for this great honor. I'll cherish it for the rest of my life.
somebody was FaceTiming. That's pretty good. Well done. Congratulations, Laura. One more round of applause for all of our six inductees this evening. I have a few quick things and then I'll, I'll let you guys go. One, if I could have a round of applause for Tom Chen and his staff who did the induction videos. They were phenomenal. Tom, thank you so much. His staff worked tirelessly on the videos, the programs, and everything, so thank you. Also, on the back of the programs, you'll see a few upcoming events for Pirate Blue. We'd love to have you out there, so please check them out. The silent auction is now closed, so if you think you won, please head over there. Uh, all six honorees, if you could please bring your plaque as well as any family members you'd want to photo with, and please head up here to the right. We're going to take some quick photos. And thank you all for attending our 2019 Senior Hall Athletics Hall of Fame dinner. Get home safely and go Pirates! <laughs>